Hi friends, welcome to the NPTEL course Strategy and Technology a Practical Primer. We are in week 7 with the theme of Dynamic Strategy Equilibrium. In this lecture, the 33rd in the series, we discuss the topic of comparators and responders. One of the most ignored facts of corporate strategy is that competitive strategy can rarely be drawn up in isolation. We did discuss in the previous lecture the importance of competitive benchmarking and taking signals from the market. Here we will focus a little more on that subject and take a strategic view of how comparators and responders can be developed out of our analysis. There are two factors which are driving the need for benchmarking. One, economic volatility and two, competitive dynamics. So we need a pervasive and expansive approach to strategy formulation. Strategic comparison and responsiveness within the organizational ecosystem and from outside the organizational ecosystem is extremely important to understand how strategy would be effective in future. Strategic comparators are both metrics and scenarios. Strategic responders reset the firm's strategy in response to the strategic comparators. We need to have a holistic strategic planning module which is an alchemy of techno-economic forecasting competitive intelligence and organizational co-competencies. Most firms try to do only some parts of this well and they do not do a holistic strategic paradigm in conceptualization and execution that well. Therefore, there is only patchy success with reference to strategic planning and execution. We try to bridge this gap through this lecture. One of the important factors of inquiry is whether there could be an industry level strategy that would be equal equally applicable to all the constituent firms, but most cases it doesn't work that way. In any industry, the strategies pursued by individual firms affect not only the industry structure, but also the competitive strategies of all other constituent firms. So if everybody follows, as I said in an earlier lecture, the same strategy, the entire industry is one strategic group. And at the same time, if each strategy is unique, then there will be as many strategic groups in the industry as there are firms. We should therefore be clear that strategy influences and gets influenced by the strategies of other firms and the overall industry structure. Every company wants to enhance its growth rate. Every company wants to be profitable. Everybody wants to be technologically adept. Still, strategies would differ and the dimensions by which we will change our strategies or have been discussed many times in the previous lectures. I will summarize them. Cost leadership, differentiation, focus on niche integration, diversification, divestment, outsourcing, globalization, offshoring. And in terms of the instruments of strategy, licensing, merger, acquisition, joint venture, collaboration, strategic alliance, listing and delisting. So the strategies seem to be available for several companies in the industry and the multitudes of companies available across the industry. But the skill of the strategist lies in trying to lead higher than the industry average growth and choosing a strategy that helps the strategists achieve that purpose. The strategy of a firm is typically drawn up at the level of the chief executive officer, chief strategy officer and the other CXOs. They all have the requisite capabilities and the wisdom to do strategic planning in a very thorough fashion. However, strategy tends to be a very introverted and cocooned activity that these leaders indulge in. The reasons are three point. One, structurally a company is set to behave in a particular way. Second, systemically the systems and process that are ingrained in the company dictate that strategy is done in a particular limited way and the mindsets, the emotional dynamics in an organization and between leaders and managers also dictate that strategy is drawn up in a suboptimal way. But in reality, we have to recognize that strategy is a highly intellectual activity. We have seen how data analytics is as important as years of experience, how quantitative analysis is as important as qualitative judgment and vice versa. The larger the organization, the more the complexity of the business or businesses, the greater is the need for inclusivity. 
we therefore need ground level strategy development covering all the functions domains and regions and we should also have a very sharp eye for internal and external factors and the limited way and also a time titrated way within one or two months in which the strategy is drawn up negates the requirements of these two points which i have highlighted we generally have very small departments to undertake strategy in a company even if a company is large strategy department hardly is more than 5 to 10 individuals it is also relatively cocooned it's a headquarters activity the strategy department has visibility to the top leaders and vice versa but strategy department doesn't work in close coordination with the rest of the leaders below therefore the ability to capture the required nuances and details and conduct necessary sophisticated analysis is by definition reduced that's where the theory of strategic comparators and responders comes in systemically industrial managers and leaders despite the strong managerial learning that emphasizes coping with uncertainty with a wide range of tools do not excel in deploying the right tools for various contexts people look things through the prism of either quantitative or qualitative analysis and that divide depends on the mindset of the individual industrial manager persons who believe that strategy formulation is an esoteric science abound in organizations of strategy departments this factor and the distance strategies tend to create between themselves and other members of the organization results in a disconnect between ground realities capabilities of the broader organization aspirations of the senior leaders and the potentialities of the organization all these four function and work in different ways these factors as well as the lack of quality external data and the constant time required to such data make it even more difficult to develop a holistic strategic planning process it is therefore expedient and tempting for strategy departments to be introverted talk to others as per convenience and draw up a strategy plan quickly i know of companies which try to do the entire strategic plan for the next 5 to 10 year horizon within a time span of just 2 to 3 months they roll it over and functions are expected to follow but the benefits of a strategic plan also disappear for different reasons as soon as a strategic plan is done it is metricized and calendarized more particularly when that strategic plan is converted into annual plan and when that first annual plan is converted into monthly budget therefore the entire uh, flexible strategic approach that should guide a responsive and agile leadership is going to become a step by step implementing budget and that itself removes the strategic plan at least in the first year of its flexibility and ability to innovate thereafter the firm keeps on monitoring its performance against the budget rather than the external developments or competitor achievements the firm therefore misses out on the opportunity to overcome the new challenges or spot new opportunities economic environment has become more volatile and competitive dynamics have become more intense professionals therefore should look at including in the strategic planning process each and every individual who has something to do with the economic volatility or competitive dynamics that requires a more pervasive and expansive approach to strategy formulation and if you are not expansive and extroverted even great companies have their issues there was a top it player which was preoccupied with implementing and continuing the strategies related to the dot com era as a result it didn't plan for the post dot com scenario the company started getting only low margin deals even if they are large it lost out a great opportunity and the impact of that panned out for several years thereafter another top it player was so focused on the global financial meltdown it became oblivious to the competitors efforts to build capacities for the post crisis global economy as a result the firm lost its edge in consultancy capacity customer access and became relegated to a lower spot there was another leading player which 
thought it was the best in terms of its employee practices. And it also felt that the leadership charisma was so high that only salaries and compensation structures do not attract people to stay in the company. As a consequence of this thought process, the company did away with employee stock options for certain sections of the employees. And the company had to rule later that employees started leaving and attrition shot up because employee stock options was one of the fundamental innovations done by that organization to attract people and also make them feel that the company is their own. There was another company, this time in the telecom space, which was unable or unwilling to accept the superiority of other operating systems that were more competent and more pervasive. They had a belief in their own proprietary system and it made that global company lose the edge in the smartphones. The companies cited above recovered the lost ground in their own domains or in other domains, but that had to be achieved only after the core issue got addressed. Even then, the loss of time and the loss of potential revenues because of these unsettling developments did have impact on the company's growth profile as well as on the market capitalization. So a continuous blending of internal and external benchmarking helps the CEO keep the strategy balanced and focused. Just as an introverted strategy is bad, an extroverted strategy also could be similarly bad. Some of the strategies are so excited by the opportunities that lie outside the organization that they are always looking at those kinds of opportunities only and would like to respond only to external stimuli. A continuous external focus is required, we have talked about that earlier and it also keeps the company well benchmarked with what is happening outside the world. But a good strategist needs to pick only those few things which will take the company on a growth path. Not everything needs to be picked or not everything should be picked. Picking too many growth drivers or having random movement on this strategy spectrum will spread the company's resources too thin. More importantly, such an approach dilutes the managerial bandwidth, confuses the people. The tendency to keep tracking each and every development in the marketplace ensures that even the essential core plans are not adequately addressed. As a company faces strong competition in core areas from the focused companies, it is important for the company to move on relentlessly in its core path. Running helter-skelter is hardly a prescription of success against such determined competition. So apparently, strategies counter to each other, whether to be completely internally focused or completely externally focused. The golden mean is being a combination of both and having a balance between internal focus as well as external focus. Let us look at what happens if you have an extroverted strategy which leads to random moves in terms of strategic disposition and execution of companies. If an organization keeps on pursuing every opportunity and retracts against every challenge, it pressurizes the organizational system and it doesn't possess any notable benefit. Such organizations may end up losing the game. Let's look at a hypothetical pharmaceutical company's strategic roller coaster over 20 years with the approach of extroverted strategy and an attempt to respond to every opportunity and risk. All this comprises certain blue arrows which are outward and red arrows which are inward. Blue arrows mean the strategy is to move forward responding to the external factors. Red internal arrow means it is drawing back from the strategy and trying to be cocooned. Now the forward blue is build API capacity, build formulations capacity, build R&D capacity, acquire formulations plant, qualify plants for US FDA, establish overseas subsidiaries, increase US based capacity, increase in licensing, acquire a new API plant, build a new formulations plant. They all look good. But when you look at the rollback or the red, the company also started reducing the API capacity, reducing the API production, reducing the exposure to China, reducing the product count, reducing the SKUs, reducing the number of formulations, 
exiting certain markets, reducing R&D, closing unprofitable subsidiary, accepting lower market share and so on. So what was considered as good strategy in each case was also being rolled back. It is not just being responsive to the market or performance, it is just being running helter skelter. Given that any project requires deployment of huge resources, people, facilities, materials and finances, a company that keeps on toggling between forward and reverse games is going to keep the company completely confused and lose its energy in the process. There will be great stress in the organization. So forward moves must be thought of with great foresight as well as experiential wisdom and data analytics. And once those paths are determined, unless there are real requirements to change the path, every external trigger need not be taken as a fresh stimulus to alter that path. So the pitfalls of extroverted strategy are many. We have to balance being introverted and being extroverted. There will always be new opportunities and new vistas of growth. At the same time, there will be challenges in the paths already laid. Prudence in respect of strategy demands selectivity in choosing the right incremental opportunities and resilience to stay on course on the paths already chosen. We can have on one side extreme stability in strategy, on the other hand extreme change in the strategy. If you have extreme stability, you will have clear path, stable journey, but it will also give complacence and run the upsurges risk. On the other hand, if you have extreme change in the strategy, you are of course going to have extra paths of which one or two could be real blockbusters. But the organization would be confused and stressed. It will lose out to focused competitors. So from a majorly introverted to a majorly extroverted spectrum polarities, you have the options. Internal efficiencies and external adaptation are both important for any growth oriented company and they have to be balanced in such a manner that the focus is there at the same time resilience is there. Belief in what is being done should be there but at the same time openness to accept the change should be there and that is the job which can be done with the perspicacity by only the CEO and the CXOs including the chief strategy officer. So we have to look at getting some dynamic equilibrium. We should get directional stability for business and performance comparison vis-a-vis -vis plans but at the same time we need to be adaptive and flexible to new incremental opportunities that will arise. A good strategic formulation must achieve a meaningful balance between directional stability and adaptive flexibility. Mark these words directional stability. From a directional viewpoint the direction should be clear but as you progress on that path of direction you must also be flexible in accepting newer opportunities that would come your way. So stable growth, dynamic growth. Between the two you have sustainable growth. We have already seen how capacity expansion requires lead times of several years and that it comes in bundles. Similarly, even tactical operations such as inventory management will require you to keep 3 months of stocks or 6 months of stocks especially if you are dealing with strategic contracts in global markets. So we cannot respond lackadaisically for such requirements. We have to think through those strategic and tactical decisions and that is the responsibility of the strategy formulators. We should be adaptive but at the same time we should have internal stability. It is easy to make internally relevant stable plans but it is very difficult to make plans which are externally responsive and therefore there is always a temptation to make plans which are based on internal feedback, internal consultations and which is internally focused and we tend to be oblivious of the external developments. The wise firm must institutionalize strategic comparison and responsiveness as a strategic management ethic. The theory of strategic comparators and responders proposed here is quite different from the existing concepts of competitive benchmarking or strategy development. In the theory of competitive benchmarking, we have several metrics that capture operational and market performance of the firm as well as the competitors. These include market share, published financials and stock prices. However, simple benchmarks such as these do not project adequately the transformational trends that have been happening or that would happen. 
how such transformational trends would rewrite the path of progress of the companies and the industry is not very clear from those benchmarks. Operational metrics are cross-sectional. They are not reflective of the long-term trends, nor do they adequately reflect the future developments. How there could be an equilibrium or disequilibrium is not apparent from those metrics. The framework of strategic competitors and responders goes beyond such external or internal benchmarking. It integrates a holistic appraisal of the strategic plans and execution of competitors in an industry. The theory focuses not only on delivered results and metrics, but also on strategic intent and core competencies of the firms in the industry. I take two examples. Two of India's largest conglomerates, Reliance of Mukesh Ambani and Adani of Gautam Adani, established successful groups in economy-facing sectors. Both the conglomerates announced in 2021 plans to enter into different new age sectors. For Reliance, established businesses were oil and petrochemicals, telecommunications and retail. And the company announced new businesses in terms of green energy, renewables, gigafactories. Adani's established businesses have been ports, airports, logistics, power, renewables, gas, FMCG. And it has announced new businesses in terms of cement, copper, petrochemicals. More recently, it has also announced entry into aluminium. The strategist of one conglomerate can use the performance metrics of the other conglomerate only to limited utility. Much of the future play can be read only through strategic appraisal of the other conglomerate. The ability to analyze the other firm's strategy is critical for any firm to be successful in developing its own strategy. Under this framework of strategic appraisal, the strategic capabilities of the CEO and the CSO are truly tested. What are the key external themes? Strategic competitors emerge as both metrics and scenarios. These are to be seen both quantitatively and judgmentally. Strategic responders reset the firm's strategy in response to the strategic competitors. Metrics are just a means to predict the future based on statistical sciences, but more importantly, based on experiential judgments given the complexity of the developments. So there are four factors, macroeconomic factors, microeconomic factors, macro-industrial factors and micro-industrial factors. Competitors occur at four levels like this and these two dimensions are economy and industry. As far as macroeconomic trends are concerned, current trends and social aspirations indicate a major transformation for India. The country aspires to be and is also likely to become the third largest economy by 2035 with further growth potential. There will be greater rural inclusivity and all road development. At a microeconomic level, changing demographics will lead to around 60% of the population being of 30 years of age or below with higher levels of income. This would portend a major transformation in consumption patterns. From a macro-industrial perspective, therefore, new industrial sectors catering to children and youth could be the new drivers of industrial growth. At a micro-industrial level, firm and industry-specific competencies refined in industries such as automobiles, pharmaceuticals, IT, engineering, communication, defense and electronics could become factors of national comparative advantage. Any strategic planning process must therefore address the economic industrial scenario in a comprehensive manner as the nation moves towards the third largest economy status globally. Strategic planning in the 1960s and 1970s advocated the analysis of economic and technological environment as a primary component of long-range planning. Firms felt it was important to have economic analysts including econometricians in long-range planning departments. However, the slow rates of change in the external environment during those periods caused such analytics to seem like a redundant non-value adding exercise. In fact, Tata Group was one of the earliest uh, companies to have established Tata Economic Consultancy Services to help the group in terms of economic analysis and of course that service got extended to other uh, firms and other industries as well. Strategists and CEOs however began to focus more on firm specific internal factors than on economy related or global related external factors. 
This trend fortified over the 1980s to 2000s. C. K. Pranlad's concept of core competencies of the firm reinforced this trend of looking internally about the competencies of a firm. Although Michael Porter focused on micro-industrial environment as an influence over competitive strategy, his prescription also focused on firm-level competencies. The radical changes in global economic environment are marked by the emergence of rapidly developing economies such as China and India and also accompanied by exponential growth in new technologies not only in the developed world but also in the developing world. An understanding of the rapidly changing external environment and the related technological drivers has become more paramount than ever. We need a more nimble and perceptive strategic response mechanism along with the perceptive strategic insight capturing mechanism. This assumes great importance for the strategies. The ability to forecast discontinuities and points of inflection and their likely evolution and the political potential economic impact on other situations and entities is a key strategic skill. Every industry has got several issues and these issues raise more questions than answers. There are more uncertainties than certainties. The direction is known. but in what way this direction will fructify in terms of industrial change and firm level impact is not yet clear. The resolution of such issues is extremely important for the framework of strategic comparators and responders. For example, what will be the course of COVID pandemic? People thought that it would be moving out of uh, global environment by the end of 2021. But uh, on the other hand, a new variant has come with greater transmissibility, Omicron. Therefore, the course of COVID pandemic is still uncertain. Will there be universal vaccination and medicines? How many boosters one would need? Will the oral drugs be the new manna? Will lockdowns be a perpetual feature? Or will the capacity restrictions be a better feature? How will diversity, equity and development be affected because of the pandemic impact? When you look at electric vehicles, when and how will the electric vehicles phase in? How will the prices of solar modules decline? How will climate occur? Or the COP 20C kind of conferences translate into industry and company goals? How will interest rates and bond yields move? How will liquidity taper? Will there be a taper tantrum? What will be the levels of future globalization and protectionism? Will there be really a China plus one strategy across the board? Which countries will be able to benefit from that? Will China be a more dominant global industrial and economic power? Will technology firms be under pressure globally or will they have a new growth future? What will be the inter competition among emerging markets? What will be the direction and pace of startup movement? What will be the standing of India in the global talent pool? The issues raised above have no easy answers, nor do they have any certain answers. Some may not have answers that are visible at this point of time. The issues, questions and answers will keep moving in dynamic equilibrium and disequilibrium. At times, bits of information will make it feel as though the answers are at hand. But as more information becomes available, we will get to know that the answers are still elusive. In this uh, environment, central banks have got a great influence. Uncertainty is the only certainty in the emerging world. Volatility is the only constant. The emerging environment does not lend itself to classic statistical and technical analysis of the past to arrive at the future. The scale and flow of the businesses have moved so much that the fallibility of large industrial individual firms and businesses is capable of putting to risk in entire economies. Too big to fail has come up as a phrase. Central bankers learning from the global financial meltdown are now clear and determined in the use of liquidity, interest rates and stimulus to encourage development when it is required or to control inflation when it is required. Strategy formulators are now expected to marshal intuition, experience and analytics in equal measure to develop judgments on the future. CXOs who will rely on pure analytics are unlikely to take their forms far. Neither would CXOs who are solely intuitive or biased by their own experiences. Emerging economies could throw up new points of inflection unexpectedly. Pre-COVID, new airliner formations were emerging, but 
post covid the order could change dramatically governments central bankers and multilateral agencies have bigger roles than ever if the ceos of the established airlines try to forecast future scenarios through yearly measurement of air kilometers they would quite be off the mark as well as too late to respond in the covid and post covid situation data analytics is therefore not the only solution it is probably not the whole solution we have to connect the dots faster and better strategy formulators in the new era need to not only understand the dots that could lead them to the future but also learn to connect them faster and better not many firms predicted that china would make massive investments in super fast bullet trains and therefore let the initiative to slip away that allowed for china to develop its own uh, bullet train technology and even offer for select countries similarly not many advanced nations and their national firms predicted that india would double its growth rate and also have greater growth potential growth passion in the country such companies and such nations missed the opportunity to participate in the growth and even accelerate it japan clearly missed this opportunity and let korea take part of this opportunity japan and japanese firms for example were so close to it so far from india they could not foresee that india could be one of the largest markets and production centers in the world for automobiles electronic and consumer goods even today despite this experience some countries and national firms are still unwilling to visualize india being at the cusp of a new qualitative revolution taking growth to a new trajectory similarly indian government and firms as well as financial institutions need to realize that india can acquire overseas assets much more expansively and decisively than it has done so far and become therefore a global player so many of the dots are getting visible some dots are getting connected but more dots can be connected to make india a global power and the firms can drive this transformation by being positive proactive future ready based on not only data analytics but also insightful experience the aspirations and behaviors of nations societies governments firms industries and economies as well as of administrators leaders professionals employees and people in general present innumerable indicators of a transformational future diverse futures could be relevant for different firms ceos and cxos must have the perspicacity and capability to see the futures beyond the obvious through multiple lenses when uh, elon musk of tesla thinks of uh, space shuttles putting uh, individuals on mars he is thinking beyond even the distant obvious when he thinks of uh, hyperloop he is thinking of uh, going beyond what could be thought about in terms of transportation and he has already done that in terms of electric vehicles by pursuing the vision and mission when other companies more endowed were unwilling to do mild ripples of change often turn into huge waves of transformation firms would have only small windows of time to retool their strategies and redirect their execution unidirectional companies obviously face greater challenges on this front the saving grace is that growth economies offer baseline growth in all sectors while offering hyper growth in select sectors conglomerates may appear to have greater flexibility to capture opportunities across the economy however individual companies also could have opportunities galore whether specialized or diversified companies need to reintroduce economic demographic technological and social forecasting back into their strategic planning methodologies this alone will help the companies meet future challenges and opportunities and develop appropriate mechanisms to respond to them this external visionary approach and strategic orientation requires a major transformation in how budgets and strategic plans are formulated in firms it cannot just be the five year 10 year and one year rituals anymore we need to have strategic simulations and strategic budgets we cannot have strategic plans and operational budgets we have to move from that situation to a situation of strategic simulations of scenarios and strategic budgets of guiding on a strategic route the operations firms would need to reconfigure the strategic planning and budgeting process by a two way equilibrium strategic plans should be unburdened of needless quantitative load 
and instead certain foundational strategic elements should be introduced in the budgeting process. I am aware a company which has increased or decreased demand for products in a particular market based on the progress of COVID rather than looking at COVID as a cyclical phenomenon or with reference to the particular disease patterns that are impacted by economic lockdowns and COVID related restrictions, the company looked at a quantitative movement of the budgets and that has led to the company missing the bus during certain periods and the company producing unnecessarily during certain periods. Therefore, insights are more important than analytics at some points of time. And at all points of time, both insights and analytics must be combined. To enable these strategic plans while being retained on a five-year rolling basis must be developed in terms of multiple scenarios rather than with singular quantitative precision. Simultaneously, the annual budgeting cycle would need to be extended into a rolling two-year span to provide the potential to cover strategic programs from investment to commercialization cycle. This twin change would enable companies to be prepared for dynamic changes in the environment. A two-year strategic budgeting cycle, though different from the current corporate practice of a yearly span, would be the required transformation for operating executives to view their programs with the right strategic perspective. That is, you are making a budget a strategic plan and a strategic plan a visionary scenario. A five-year scenario-driven strategic plan might also be unusual for the absence of quantitative rigor, but it would certainly enable strategic readability and flexibility. While we are doing strategic simulations and developing strategic budgets, we should also note that the strategic budgeting process is the bridge between strategic appraisal of competitors and strategic execution by the firm. This will enable appropriate response to strategic comparators that are developed. ESG, Environmental Empathy, Corporate Social Responsibility and Corporate Governance are extremely important critical drivers of business development in future. Company financial reports, annual reports, sustainability reports provide a wealth of information on physical and financial parameters and investment indices apart from the standard information on balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement and asset schedule. As I said probably earlier, in India these reports also provide such additional information on underlying strategic parameters such as licensed and installed capacities, production, sales, imports, exports, consumption of materials, inventories, energy consumption, technology imports, R&D investments, indigenization efforts, senior management, remuneration, etc. All this information can provide useful insights into the operating profiles as well as the ESG profiles. Most of this information is available on segmental or product basis. This information pool enables strategists to quantify and judge trends relating to several strategic parameters such as product specialization, export orientation, import dependence, asset intensity, research commitment, energy efficiency, import substitution, financial prudence, operational excellence and so on. As you can see each of these dimensions is a very reflective parameter of the strategic direction that the company could take. With BRSR, that is Business Responsibility and Sustainability Reporting becoming mandatory in India and ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance Compliance becoming globally accepted practice, there will be greater availability of diversified information including rankings by rating agencies on these parameters. By integrating such quantitative strategic parameters in strategic planning and also in the biannual planning process, strategic budgets can equip the larger organization to deliver operations in line with the corporation's strategic intent. To be able to do that, the methodology of strategic planning also must benefit from artificial intelligence. If you want to do strategic simulations, the way management sciences thought about it in terms of complex simulations or complex game theories is no longer necessary nor feasible. We need to have strategic simulations on a real-time basis. We have to develop multiple scenarios of likely external environment, competitor moves and potential strategy between the firm and any of the scenarios. For that, we need to look at three leadership attributes and three aids for analysis. 
The leadership attributes are intuition, experience, and analytics. The eights are forecasting, which has always been there. Simulation, looking based on the digital developments, and machine learning based on the artificial intelligence and others. So visualization methodologies, when combined with leadership attributes, will drive the new strategic simulation process as part of the strategic planning. We can simulate economic and industrial environments on a 2x2 macro and a 2x2 micro matrix. Each environmental facet can be in turn assessed on a 3x3 matrix of the interplay of the optimistic scenarios on the one hand and dominating coexisting and declining competitive dynamics on the other. A firm would have 36 scenarios to play around with. Assuming again that the firm chooses an aggressive middle of the road or conservative competitive strategy, there would be one or two scenarios that could develop for the firm. The possibilities are endless. The new age firm would need a new way of organizing this mammoth availability of data and insights. The strategic planning function has to be more intellectual than it has been at any point of time in the past. It has to be reinforced and this figure only tells us how we could do that and to be able to do that we need strategy bots, humans who think like robots and robots who will have the judgmental capability of human beings to combine analytics and machine learning, experience and simulation and intuition with forecasting. Then we would have a very strong visualization canvas for every company and its strategic plan. So how do we organize for this kind of strategy analysis because this is easier said than done. We need to expand and restructure our strategic planning departments into three clear specializations and that will help the strategy departments meet the new age challenges of internally competent and externally sensitive strategic planning. Specialization 1. That stream should be driven by public policy experts, economists and technologists. These people are best equipped to forecast global economic and technological scenarios. Such people should be brought into the company to be key advisors on the strategy front and one or two could be full time employees as well. Specialization number two will focus on competitive intelligence to identify and analyze strategies and execution plans of competitors. It is not just measuring electric vehicles as percentage of total vehicles or looking at who is supplying what. It is much more of the strategic insight into how this trend would become a wave in future. Specialization 3 would be internally driven, analyzing the firm's strengths and weaknesses and developing the firm's strategic options to achieve a fit with multiple economic and technological scenarios while addressing competitor strategies. We should fit the macroeconomic as well as microeconomic scenario. We should fit the macro industrial as well as the micro industrial scenario. This holistic strategic planning process identifies the drivers of competitive strategy. That would be done in a contextually meaningful combination of various theories of strategy. I bring forward for you the concept of strategy bot. We have executive bots, we have personal bots, we have bots as assistants. When you click into a site, we have chat bots assisting you in your requirements. But strategy to take shape, as I have discussed in this theory of strategic comparators and strategic responders, you need a strategy bot, which is capable of understanding internally competitive information as well as externally sensitive information. Then only the strategic planning will be internally competitive and externally sensitive. For that you need techno-economic forecasts, you need SWOT analysis, you need competitive intelligence. The long-term organizational view should be to integrate the huge developments that are taking place in data analytics, artificial intelligence and machine learning to create such strategy bots which can pour over and synthesize the billions of bytes of data and keep creating and recreating strategic simulations. These strategy bots would help strategists free themselves from overwhelming data overloads and focus on critical scenarios and milestones. The chief strategy officer would need to be both an erudite synthesizer of the enormous amount of information that is generated and also an outstanding collaborator of multiple specialists to arrive at the most plausible set of strategic comparators and the most feasible set of competitive responding strategies. The new age strategy officer must be a professional par excellence 
who can pioneer and institutionalize the new paradigm of strategic comparators and responders in the firm. As I said, strategy planning in the emerging era is likely to be and probably in my opinion most certainly be a more intellectual exercise than it has been ever in the past. With this I conclude today's lecture. Hope to see you in the next lecture soon.